How's everyone doing so far? Sweet. So uh, this is like, I have like a, a sort of plan of how this is going to go, and I think one person knows who's going to get asked to speak first, and she's kind of like nervous. But don't be. It's going to be awesome. So we're going to start uh, with our first question, and uh, it's going to be directed to uh, Jennifer. Uh, so it's from your experience, what is being done in Ottawa, or as I mentioned, uh, or more broadly, uh, if your work is in focus just in Ottawa? Uh, to so what is sorry, what is being done in Ottawa to recreate relationships between Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples? And uh, as I said, I'm giving them floor to Jennifer first, but after she's made her point, uh, everyone else or anyone else is welcome to queue in. Well, I kind of said, you know, I think the, the most obvious thing to say would be uh, Nigon, so Gichi uh, Makwech to uh, Nigon, the coordinators. <laughs> and I think that, I mean, really uh, moving here in September 2012 uh, from a place that um, was just starting to mobilize, I, I mean, we're just in the process in Mississauga that just gone through building the Peel Aboriginal Network to now working to become a friendship center, uh, moving from a place where um, there was a struggle to build community and get people together um, to represent in an urban area. It's been really awesome to, to come here and to see the kinds of things going on and it just happened to come at the right time um, for I don't know more to start up uh, as I got here and I, I mean it, teaching in and through as I don't know more has gone on I think that for me um, that has been absolutely huge seeing the difference in my students from last year to this year when I ask them why they're in the classroom what they hope to get out of it because I assume most of them are there with good hearts good minds wanting to learn they've said I don't know more I don't know more I don't know more that made me pay attention um, but I mean, I think it's important to note that it's not just I don't know more. This is stuff that's been going on, but the tool that the internet, you know, um, served as to make it more widespread has been really amazing. So the thing that I automatically think, like what helps build relationships between indigenous peoples and settlers are the community organizations that are already here, uh, giving strength to the indigenous peoples living in the area, helping them recover from colonization or helping them to navigate living in, um, an urbanized center, helping them build alliances with people. I think by and large, um, those are the most uh, important things being done to build those relationships. Um, but there have been some really amazing things that I, you know, I've, I've seen things fly through Facebook all the time. Um, honor the two row wampum, people probably heard about that, the 400th anniversary to commemorate the Gaswentha or the two row wampum. Um, months of events going on through Haudenosaunee territory, um, to try and re-establish re and reaffirm the nation-to-nation -nation relationships between uh, Haudenosaunee people and settlers. And, um, I mean, just on the academic part, one of the cool things to notice coming up this week, I think it's the 20th and the 21st, is um, Champlain and the uh, Anishinaabe Aki. And I think uh, what's kind of amazing about that is that we have Chief Gilbert White Duck coming in to speak. And, I mean, in the academy, in the university, you don't, you have a tradition of not having these voices present um, on these kinds of topics and events, right? The historical narrative is very, very narrow. So I think it's actually amazing that there is a university here, and I've seen it in other universities now because of the young people that are coming in and changing the university culture. They're forcing these kinds of conversations to happen and making sure their voices are represented. So, I mean, that's something cool. Well said. Anyone else like to add on to that? Ed, please, you have a mic. Um, I, I think it's a, uh, I think it's, we're at a special time, um, because as I kind of alluded to in my introduction, I've been working on these issues for a few years, and we're at a time now where it seems like everything builds on something else and leads to something more. Um, you mentioned uh, the activities in the Haudenosaunee territory. Um, Kairos was involved in something called the Nation to Nation Bike Tour, which went from Akwesasne to Tayananega and started with five, five days of orientation in Akwesasne. And there were 12 indigenous and non-indigenous youth who participated. 
Um, and three of them were from Akasasana. And a big part of the tour was the blanket exercise, which Kairos has developed over the years with a lot of partners. And in the end, at the end of the tour, which, which, which stopped in communities along the way, not indigenous communities. Um, it was those three uh, youth from Akasasne who were leading the exercise and the workshops. And what we've been able to do then is, is uh, encourage them to continue to work with us um, to help uh, build these relationships through workshops, something like the blanket exercise. And so we'll be in Chelsea at the beginning of uh, October. Um, in a community that we haven't worked in before, but just as an example of building that uh, relationship. And I think it's important too that when we talk about uh, where is this happening, it happens in the work before the event. Um, so Kairos has this event that happens every year called Covenant Chain Link. And what the idea of that event is, is to bring together people in the community, indigenous and non-indigenous people, in particular with the focus on what we call educators, to use uh, Jennifer's air quotes here. Um, and we don't mean just people in the schools, but people who are educated in communities and, and so forth. And what happens in those, as we plan those events and make contact with the people who we would like to be participating in the event, we build the relationships that are so important. And the event is sort of like, you know, the culmination of all that work and has that much more energy as a result. And so this year, October 18th to 20th, there's information on the table outside, a shameless play, a promo event. Um, we're going to focus on youth. So we'll have guest speakers, we'll have keynote speakers, but the focus is going to be on young people and what young people are doing in this community to build those relationships. The idea being that we want the educators there so that they, when they go forward and educate, They'll have people that they can call on for help. So, you know, we're meeting each other today. I mean, I've heard about all of you folks, but I've never met you. And, and so this gives us another opportunity. Next time we're organizing something, next time we're planning something, we can call on each other. So I'm excited by the fact that there seems to be so much energy around coming together to have these kind of conversations, but that they don't stop there, that they always seem to build and lead to something else. Thank you, Ed. Um, if no one else would like to queue uh, the well, result of in regards to your question, uh, I would say not enough is done. Uh, well, that, that's what I was going to say. If you're not going to queue on that part, there's another question. There's a part B, but uh, let me, let me. What uh, isn't being done is the next question. Major, major, major. What do you think needs improvement? What, what is not being done? Oh, sorry. So, there you go. Jean Luc, but in terms, but in terms of uh, name dropping, there's uh, um, Kairos is one of them, but I mean, Megan is uh, definitely. Uh, um, actually, the one that's I feel making the most with uh, indigenous people, so in that solidarity movement as well. Um, but also uh, keep in mind that uh, so there's different social gatherings that are happening in different uh, you know areas that brings people together from all directions, and this is a place to raise awareness through networking, through dialogue, and stuff like that. So let's uh, let's keep that in our mind as well. I feel. Um, MASK is an organization that's involving institutions, uh, uh, no, sorry, in schools uh, and uh, education institutions, pretty much. Uh, and what they're doing is they're, um, they're, they're finding a realistic approach to education. So they use art as a way to convey messages and educate. So um, myself, I'm working currently with Aboriginal Experience, and we're putting on a, a show tackling bullying and racism. And MASK is actually our, uh, you know, our. Uh, uh, they're gonna hire us to go in schools and, and present that, you know, in uh, um, in schools to educate and raise awareness on those issues. So, I mean, there there are organizations at, that are actively uh, doing the work. Um, as people, we are doing the work as well to uh, our you know everyday dialogue, uh, conversation, and social network now. So, I mean, there's a lot, but not enough yet. So, yes. Thank you. So yeah, we touched on like what isn't being. Like, Kaya, did you want something? I felt like you breached your mic. Yeah, no, okay. <laughs> Kaya. I, I think um, I, I'm new to the Ottawa region as well. We moved down from Nunavut in 2012. And, and one of the things that I found to be uh, the greatest uh, tool for coming together has been social media. It really helped me 
realized where the connections were to be had here. Um, this didn't help a bit too. Um, just, you know, I had some connections. I, I knew Ian's sister and I met Ian. And then through the universities, there's unique here studying and then the community that was very foreign to me when we first moved down became very, very small very quickly and I was comfortable again. Um, what, uh, my experience in terms of the relationship between indigenous peoples and settlers uh, is in Nunavut and um, you need make up I think like 90% of the population. So the, uh, it's kind of a different world than, than what's happening here in Ottawa. Um, and I think that most settlers that go north, um, the climate <laughs> gets you pretty quickly and you realize where you are and you have to adapt. Um, my uh, exposure has also been in, in industry. My line of work um, exposes me to businesses and I think that one of the things that has forced an interaction between indigenous communities and non-Indigenous and the rest of the world has been the state of the economy and the interest in development in Canada. And that is forcing really interesting conversations. I think a lot of businesses are realizing that if you want to do business, um, the nature of the jurisprudence and the cases that have come out, Indigenous rights from a legal perspective are, are are gaining strength and recognition and they're becoming harder to ignore. And that is forcing industry uh, to, to look at the community where they want to do work and start thinking partnerships and, and co the own consultation that is owed in the eyes of the government and the law of the reality that these things have to be either joint ventures or partnerships or you know, it's forcing the necessity for prior informed consent by virtue of the fact that people are realizing this. And, and I think that from what I've seen, industry, um, get, some have social conscience and some have ethics and others need to be reminded and then we go to court. Um, <laughs> are, are making those steps and, and I think that that's just sort of one area where I've noticed uh, it might not be the conversation that they wanted to have, but it's having some positive impacts. I noticed you grabbed a mic, Ian. I was about to. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought you were you wanted to cue in, but I mean, I feel like he might have something to say to. Uh, we were discussing how like, the the relationship is improving, or now the second half of that question is like, what area? needs improvement. What here in Ottawa or just in general? I, I mean it's it's based on your experience. I mean you're you're a pretty world traveled yeah. person, but I mean a lot of your work is done here in the in the capital. So yeah, like, absolutely. Well like uh, a mean? lot of people don't understand our, our history. Like it's never really been taught. Even like, you know, Gian Gomeshi mentioned that he learned about uh, residential schools like months ago and he grew up like he grew up in Canada. I, I hear you. I mean myself uh, I, I grew up, I didn't grow up around too many uh, other indigenous youth growing up, but when I moved to Ottawa, I, I met um, like much more, or many more, and uh, I'm almost embarrassed to say that it wasn't until my late teens that I learned about residential schools, and my mother herself like attended one of these schools for like several years, like I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I mean, yeah, like there's definitely a lack in the education yeah, definitely. system. So like, uh, you know, we tour, we did a talk like just like this in uh, Edinburgh, in, in the, the, the university there, and people had no idea. And there was anthropology students, and they had no idea about residential schools. So I was able to bring up, you know, that, that alcoholism, alcoholism was like a, it is something that we face, but I was able to explain why. And like gener generational trauma of, of residential schools and colonialism, which is something that, that, you know, a lot of people never really got. So it, it comes down to educating, it comes down to conversations. And that's what, like, uh, I think that Twitter and Facebook and all these, these social media things are super important now. Because we were put on reserves on purpose. Like, it's out, it's out of walking distance from any major city on purpose, right? We were out of sight, out of mind. But now we have this, this, these tools where we're able to ch chime into conversations and we're able to, like, call people out on racism. We're able to do that sort of thing. And uh, now it's causing that friction that, that 
is, is possible for us to have our civil rights movement. Oh, would you say that's happening right now? Like, if like you're, you're, you're comparing it to the uh, African American civil rights movement that, that took place Absolutely. in the United States. Well, what was going on in the States, too, they, they were in the same city, right? So you had you know, people of African descent and white, and white people, and there was like a streak well, most of the time in cities that you don't cross. And, like, one side was there as well, one side was the others. And there was a ton of friction. That's where like riots and all that had to come up. And, uh, you know, their civil rights movement was met with, with uh, water cannons and dogs and police and they overcame and that's amazing. Any civil rights movement we had, we tried to have, was in, under federal uh, jurisdiction. So we were met with tanks, M16s and, and military right away, you know what I mean? So we've never really had a chance to to do this, to have this friction yet. So this is a really, really, really important time and it's really exciting right now. Absolutely, so we suddenly have a voice. That's right. We suddenly have an ego. That's right. And uh, with that said, thank you very much to any everyone, anyone and everyone that has attended these events. Um, Neil, uh, did you want to say something? Um, what, what I've noticed is that there's been a lot of, uh, we talk a lot about standing together with each other. You might have to put your mic closer. Just, it's unidirectional. All right, thanks. Is that better? Okay, so we talk a lot about standing together with each other and coming together and being united as a people, but uh, the various movements that we have as a people, unlike the movements of the, the civil rights movements of the black people, they were united, period, across. Um, whereas the movements that we have these days that I see is they're secular. They, they want to be united, but they're not actually united with everybody else. If we're gonna move forward and if we're gonna have our civil rights movements, Embraced and embraced by not just our people, but all the people in this in this country, um, and then our supporters who are in this country and in other countries. Then we need to be united across all our, our movements. We need to have one unified voice, not necessarily a singular entity like a, a group, but we need to all be sharing the same the same thing when we go to St. Nikon. We need to support the, the fact that the, the name of the race, the Redskins, is racist. And then it pisses us off. And then if there's one of us that is upset about it, then the name should be changed, period. Um, when, we, when we go to the, the rallies for say the 60s school, if you're there for, for FSIS or you're there for NLAC or you're there for, as, a, as a speaker for the Dalmanina Friendship Center or for Nikon, that's the message you're promoting. That's the message at, at that event. Everybody speaks about that. You can speak about it in relation to say like the Native Friendship Center supports that, or the Native Friendship Center supports the Neon Conversations. But it's it's also about us supporting you in what you're doing as for our people. So that we're united no matter what we do. So no matter where who comes after us or who, who wants to challenge us in the media, we're always saying the same thing. We're always saying we're together, period. End of story. I want to be very careful because like I, I hear you and agree with you 110 percent but sometimes i feel myself personally if we're talking about things that need to improve and need to change because i feel like um it's hard to it's hard to have one universal want or need when oh, you absolutely because i feel like people often forget uh, that there are over 600 different nations in this country and like often we're just thought of as one giant collective like one one nation and in a sense like i mean there's that there's that camaraderie, a, a mutual respect at the same time. My opinion is people need to remember that there are so many unique uh, nations. I don't, I don't think that you can, I don't think that it's, it's impossible to have a unified voice without respecting the fact that there's over 600 nations. Oh, no, no. There's over a, a several million people who are Aboriginal or First, Na First Nations in it or Métis. I, I, yeah, I think it is possible. I think it hasn't been done. Yeah, I, I think like, that it needs to be done. Maybe if there's something like you know, like honoring treaties or something that that everyone that everyone that has, you know what I mean? Like that's that's a unifying thing. It doesn't matter what nation you're from. We all have treaties that aren't being honored, so it's time to like start talking about that sort of thing. Exactly. It's a good start. It yeah. can be done. And and I think that I think there are. I mean, each. I I agree that you don't want to. I mean, the problem is that in the relationship settlers and indigenous way back. Indigenous people have been lumped into that 
group, you know, even the Constitution, Aboriginal people, you know, three categories. Well, you know, how, that that doesn't even cover it. I mean, Inuit, Span, Alaska, Greenland, you know, the whole country, and then you have it's just that categorizing and lumping into one year Aboriginal. So you guys all have to have the same voice, and I think that there has to be. A, a respect and a support, but I think that the message has to be that each nation is entitled to self-determination. And, and yes, I support, as, as part of the Indian community, I support the fight of the you know, Métis community, the Algonquin community, um, because we're kind of fighting the same beast, but um, so I agree with you, I agree with you, and that's all I have to say. So diplomatic, thank you. Uh, uh, did anyone else want to cue on that? Because like my part of my job is to keep this rolling, and I have to get us on to the next question. This is a re it's, it's 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 so hard, right, to fit it all into like one 15 minute span. It's, Ian was on our show, like uh, a co-host of a radio show. Ian came on, and like, was like one question, and we like, we killed our hour, and like <laughs> we could have gone on for like longer. But uh, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Uh, Ed, the you know, um, I just picked up on, on what you were saying, and, and the. Uh, the need to uh, demonstrate some solidarity. I think an important element of that too, because we mentioned two possible areas where we could come to agreement and treaties and self-determination. But um, I think it's important to remember that there are forces working against that all the time. And, in, and, and there are forces that are, are, are working to undermine the treaties. And uh, there's a whole issue of the modern treaties and what their, their intent is and there's a whole idea of how you know there are forces that refuse to accept the fact that indigenous peoples in Canada enjoy the right to self-determination. So those things are when we when we when we talk about the, dif the disagreements, you know, it, I think it's uh, it's important to remember it, where some of that comes from, where the source of that disagreement is from. That there are actually forces out there trying to drive wedges between people, especially if there's any indication that they're joining together and, you know, becoming a uh, recognizable and, 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 and uh, useful, powerful force. And I'll have to say to that is, as, as, a, as Anishinaabe leaders, uh, Inuit and Métis leaders, it's our responsibility to stand up against those forces and remind our people that that's what they're trying to do and that's what they want to do. They want us divided, they want us separated so that they can pick us apart. So I guess say what needs to improve is just standing together. So we can, we can agree on that. Jennifer? I just like, I think, okay, go ahead, quick. And then I'm moving on. I got it. Be super fast. Um, I just want to pick up um, on what our elders said as well, too, is, is listening. That's what I think is missing. Uh, this is a great example of the power of listening, but look at how many empty seats there are. And I think that um, for me, when I, when I think of listening and say listening, what, what that really means is that a recognition that people don't know there's, there's this attitude in Canada that people say, oh, Indians, I pay taxes, so I know all about them, so I have a right to have an opinion about what they do, how they do it, and where they do it, and all of that. And I think that there is nothing um, within Canada, uh, or on Turtle Island, so, so ill-informed. I mean, I have no opinions on um, molecular biomechanics, because I know nothing about it, and I'm willing to admit that I don't, and when someone comes to me and speaks about it, I will listen. And I think that for me, that is what is, is really missing, the encouragement to listen. And that's an important teaching. I mean, I was raised in other people's territories, but I was raised with seven grandfather teachings. And listening is so, so important. And not always having to have, keep bashing myself in the mouth with this. Um, not always having to have an opinion, that it's OK not to have an opinion, or not to think that you have to always give your opinion, because I think listening is the foundation of of respect, right? And I think that is a big thing that is, is missing. Desire to know more, to learn more, right? Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be wonderful, actually. Uh, so yes, as I said, TikTok. Uh, so at, earlier at the start, as I said, we played we played that film, uh, Howard Ethel's film, and you learned about that nameless scout who was given a name. So at, lately, um, one issue that has been in the news lately is about place naming, right? Uh, an article was written in a citizen about the light rail transit naming one of their stops Pimacy. 
on the suggestion from an Algonquin group who was asked to provide suggestions, or the transit, uh, or, oh, sorry, or the skip, it's actually there it is. Uh, da, da, da. So yeah, um, what about the names that are best, anyways, let's just talk about, it. is it tokenism, like what, do you, what are your thoughts on, on this, like, like do you, are you, John, we talked earlier about like Tennessee, like, in, but yeah. Well, um, I think it's very important to re revitalize the names, the original names. Um, KGCP is probably the most popular and it's the most people who actually know. Uh, but it's very important because we're talking about um, people that have been here, that have been traveling on the river for, you know, we say since time immemorial, but, you know, we're talking about like 10,000 years, you know, in certain areas. And depending, you know, if you follow the archaeologist, archaeologist discourse, if you follow uh, the original instruction from your, from your traditions, you know. So therefore, you know, we know people have been here for, for long, a lot longer than the settlers. So therefore, I think it's very important. It's imperative that we start revitalizing those names because with the name, you relate to the entity. Either it's a lake, it's a valley, it's a forest. Um, what we're seeing right now today, just to contextualize, you know, um, Pimizi is, is, is a fish eel, and uh, it's a, it was the main source of, of, of food for the Anishinaabe people here and other people that travel here. So I feel the name is, is nice. Uh, nice saying that's the hip hop slang. Sorry, it's it's accurate and it's uh, yeah, it's, it should be it should be. No, I don't say it should be. The community should should decide. But what the problem is with this is who do we ask? Who do do we did we consult? We consult the AOO, the Algonquin of Ontario. If you do your research, the AOO is in the business of um, bring about this modern treaty that we're seeing. The modern treaty that they're pushing. So the AOO is yes, grassroots people, but um, there are no reference, you know, in terms of, you know, oh, we're going to go see the AOO for for this, for that, for this. People from Kitty the elders from Kitty Gonzibi should come down. People from Kitty should come down. People from other areas, elders and and, and 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 leaders should come down and consult it and sit at the table and talk about what is the proper name, what is what is the the actual uh, name that will honor, you know. Uh, the legacy of the Anishinaabe people, Mount Wimini people, in this territory. Yeah, forgive me, I, I don't think yeah. that was 100% clear, uh, so I understand, and I'm, I'm with you there, yeah. but uh, this is, we're talking more like, how do you feel about, like specifically, like, you know, the light rail train uh, mm. stop, uh, they want to use an Algonquin name, yeah. right? Uh, and there seems to be some opposition because, because a lot of people don't understand what it means, they're not familiar with the term, the language, the people. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like in, in terms of place naming, like should we see more of it? Of course, of course, and uh, it, it's just a reflection of the attitude of settler people in this area. It's like, oh, it's a new name, we don't know what it is, we have no history. If it would be a Champlain stop there, it would be, oh yeah, the French people in the Quebec side, yeah. <laughs> if it would be Murray, it would be, yeah, the English people here, you know? So, you know, like, I come heard on. about him in history class, right? Stop messing, messing around, it's like, this is unceded, unsurrendered land, let's start honoring it. And start revitalizing those names. And that's what I'm not sure. You can kind of quiet. Did you wanna? Did you wanna say something? You're referring to me. You're pointing. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Clips, yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> yes, yes. Like please, if you okay. feel comfortable, please cue in. Um. Well, referring to like the specific question, like. Um, the Nepean Redskins football team. Like, this is just pure genocide and pure racism, and I'm really just tired of explaining why that is. I mean, the, ram the ramifications of this is the negative way indigenous youth, like myself, are forced to see the world. And so this is how my generation and those before me will see themselves reflected, and in fact, do see themselves reflected as. And so when all you see in your life are people committing genocide to your culture, like. How do you break free from that thinking that you and your traditions and what you stand for isn't worthless or stupid? I mean, names like this, I feel like the seeds that put youth in situations where they're ashamed to speak their language, ashamed to practice their ceremonies, even afraid to identify as being Anishinaabe. We kind of half jumped the gun there, but yes, uh, Jennifer? Um, well, you know what I mean? But that's, it's all related, right? It's all connected because, I mean, 
the the thing about um, bringing in more indigenous names into places that haven't previously recognized them is kind of like in academic speak, air quotes, um, you know, the task of rehumanization. Um, because the very foundation of, of what's gone on lies at the fundamental dehumanization of indigenous peoples, not recognizing indigenous peoples as fully human. That's what makes all of this possible. Um, and, I mean, you see that manifest in many different ways. So even, you know, um, and for sure it is contentious and definitely the, the city moves at a different pace and doesn't recognize that there are indigenous ways of doing things that would involve a much larger, longer consultation process, recognizing all of the people in the area that should have a voice in what kinds of names are brought back in. I think nevertheless, the movement towards naming begins, you know, or, or continues rehumanizing and forcing people to recognize that there were people here before them, and that is key. So people are not gonna like it because it disrupts what they think they know about where they come from and the attachment they feel that they can have. And that's a very real fear. And I see it in students all the time. And it's a realistic fear. It's an honest fear. Like, okay, if I don't fit in here anymore, and that's not my subway stop or my metro transit way stop, whatever they're called here, transit way stops. Yeah. Um, you know, then, then I don't I don't belong here. And where do I go? I don't have a home, right? But it's you know through things like this that we can start to make it clear that that's not what that's about, right? It's just a different kind of home, and and you know forcing you to be respectful of, of who else's home you're making your home on. A plus. <laughs> um, I think where there's a big concern is if if you're re reviving the indigenous names for places, that's one thing. In Nunavut, I grew up in Gilek. Um, the communities around me were Mitumatelik, Samiraya, Kalatewape, Ipeate, those were the names I knew these communities were, but on every map it was Hall Beach, Pond Inlet, Clyde River, Arctic Bay. Um, and then uh, after Nunavut became a territory, those names are slowly starting to change and, and it's becoming more official. But that's because that's what Indian always called it. But, uh, you know, a subway stop or a light rail stop, I, I hardly dealt that little piece of land to the Algonquin people was connected with that term. So it's not really revitalizing, it's recognizing and honoring, or is it appropriating? And I think that's where the discussion has to happen. Like uh, the program Katimavik. Yeah, I say that to any other Canadian kid, oh, that's a federal program where you get to go live somewhere else and hang on, do stuff and work, and it's a great program. Katimavik in Inutitu means place where people gather. There's a street in Canada called Katimavik. I'm pretty sure it doesn't have anything to do with gathering. Or maybe it does. But there is a lack of awareness of, of what that term means, what the purpose is. And I've met students who have been part of that program. Oh yeah, I was in Katimavik this year, this year, this year. But you know what that term means? You know why? It's a good word. I think it's a great word to use. Uh, it reflects the program, but it was appropriate. The kids aren't educated as to why it's used, why it's a good name. It's just throwing a name on it. So I think that where I get concerned is when it's tokens, when it's appropriation as opposed to embracing something to be what it really is. And, and if, uh, if a team's going to have a name, if a subway stop's going to have a name that's uh, a, a term or a concept that's from another culture, understand its meaning, understand its history, understand what it means to those people. Don't make a term mean a street. Yeah. <laughs> that's really interesting. Yeah. 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 Grand Cherokee, you know what I mean? Like it, it gets appropriated, it has a different name and, and idea of what it's supposed to be instead of what you know it's supposed to be. So, you know, my Cherokee friends, <laughs> um, 
you know, there, when, when you think of, of you know, Jeep Cherokee, you're not going to think of, of my Cherokee friends, you're going to think of a Jeep, which is ridiculous. So all of these appropriative names need to, need to change. Same with like uh, the Black Hawk helicopters, Apache helicopters, like all those things are, you know, it, it's completely inappropriate and they all need to go, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna call on you again because like this, this you guys are like jumping the gun. Like I'm sure you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not even looking at your cue cards. I just love it. This conversation is just going like it's going the right way, right? It's been washed, in, right? So uh, yeah. So the second half of the first of that question was like deals with the specific example of the Redskins, and like as we talked about earlier, you are sort of like our expert on on that whole debate. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, and like Kaya is like the lawyer who is representing you because you made uh, well a human. Uh, what's it's called? You filed a human rights complaint. There it is. With and then here you are. Uh, so Redskins. What's what's up with that? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, that name's got to go. That name's completely like it's, if you take race out of it completely, um, it's defined in every dictionary as offensive. So to name a youth football team that's defined as offensive is completely appropriate. Uh, that's basically like that's 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 the go-to argument for anybody that needs to argue. Well, you should feel honored. It's like, well, no, I was taught not to honor people by using a word that's defined as offensive to describe them. Um, so yeah, and uh, what it comes down to, and there's so much backlash. Like, there's so much backlash, and all I'm saying is like, guys, please like consider changing the name, and that's that's it. That's where this all came from, and. Um, the backlash has been out of control, and I got to thinking, and I was like, you know, this isn't really about a football team anymore. This is down to an entitlement of non-Aboriginal people wanting to label and oppress people the way they, they damn well feel. And they're, they're, they feel so entitled to it that they're gonna argue with Aboriginal people about how we're supposed to feel by being called an offensive word. That's what it comes down to. So, <laughs> Once you call them on their entitlement, too, it gets it gets pretty it gets pretty confrontational, and uh, but it, it's again it's a conversation that needs to be had as First Nation people. We need to be able to uh, to identify ourselves. We need to be able to label ourselves what we want to label, and uh, so these sports teams, all of these sports teams, need to go because we're the only culture that's being uh, exploited for something as arbitrary as a sports team. There's no like you don't you don't like. There's many different warrior societies, right, in all over the world. You know, Zulus, ninjas, like all of that. Like, why isn't there those being appropriated for, for sport? Like, it's only us. And again, when you get down to, the, to thinking about it for a second, uh, it, it, it's this idea that we were something that needed to be conquered in, in, in order to, or overcome at least, in order to, to settle North America. So, you know, you have bears, lions, hurricanes, Indians, redskins. Like, it all fits into the same thing. And uh, the difference between uh, you know Yankees, Vikings, Celtics, Fighting Irish, all of those teams were named by people who identified as though as as the name they were named. So you know the person who was a uh, uh, Scandinavian who named like the, the, the Vikings, and they were both Irish who named the, the Fighting Irish and the Celtics. But nobody was was Aboriginal when they named them the, the Indians, the Braves, the Red Sox, the Chiefs, like or the Red Sox, the Redskins, the Chiefs. So it comes down to calling ourselves what we want to call ourselves. So again, it goes back to dehumanizing. It goes back to, to making us this caricature. It makes us like, you know, the, the Cleveland Indians logo. That's what that's what people think we look like. So we look very, uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, not scary, very unintimidating. That's what I was looking for, caricatures. And uh, it was that? Goofy, yeah, exactly. And like, you know, to label us a red skin is, is, is completely inappropriate. Um, yeah. Uh, as, like, I know I never want to interrupt you uh, when you, you, you talk about the subject. Um, here's the thing, I found myself nodding at some parts of what you were just saying. I was like, yeah, I'm Cree, like, boom, nodding my head. It's like, yeah. But then I, then I realized, and I caught myself here, um, there are non-Indigenous people here too. So I mean, I think we could say that, like we're talking about conversations, discussions, that's great. But like, I think we, we really need to push that to, yeah, there, there are people that just don't know. They don't know why it's been solved. Oh, absolutely. And it's good, like I said, like all it takes is a conversation. And people always ask me, like, why do you argue so much on Twitter? And I do. That's, just, that's social media. I do. And like, uh, but, you know, even that one person that's like, who started off super adamant, it's like, I can call, you no, know, they're not referring to you, they're honoring you. And like every, you know, every, every single uh, argument in the book. And I change his mind or her mind. 
by the end of it. Like it makes it all worth it. And they're like, oh my god, okay, now I totally see what you're saying. Because they're like, oh, they're not referencing you. It's like, okay, it's an Aboriginal man as the logo. Like all I gotta say is, what's the logo? Like, oh, it's an Aboriginal man. I'm like, well, as an yeah, as an Aboriginal man, I don't like it because I'm being referenced. And then like that's so it, it just again it just takes a conversation. What about the indigenous women? Like saying, well, it's the same thing. Like, I, I took this on because of my daughter, my five-year-old daughter. Okay. Yeah. And you were worried because she was just finishing kindergarten. Ian's been doing this, like, this... This Ian, is the third season, so, like, two years. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's been... Because I remember when you came on the show a year ago, you said, like, last year, like, this was happening, yeah. this year, and then, now, like, two years later, and you're still fighting for... Like, yeah, ridiculous, right? I think it's completely ridiculous. You made some pretty... You made a lot of good points, and you've even offered to offer, uh, offered to assist oh. with the financial aspect of changing the name because that there is a financial factor to this, and I think unfortunately, uh, money is what you know governs a lot of these decisions. I also gave like solutions; like it didn't have to be like right away. Mm -hmm. You know no, what I mean? I'm saying you've been really understanding, uh, very active, uh, and here we are. But I mean, like I said, we're we're speaking with members of the community, both indigenous and non-indigenous, and we're just trying to like. Enlighten everyone. But, like, oh, that sounds bad. I take it back. We're just sharing. We're sharing. Yeah, we're part of the conversation. And you will actually have a moment in a few moments, like in a bit, you guys can ask some questions too, because we've covered a lot of different topics and subject matters. Uh, were you reaching for the mic? Yeah, because I, I mean, the thing is, I want to put race back into it and questions of what is racist. I think right now, uh, Native people have been so shamed into saying, oh, well, it's not because of race, it's just because it's wrong. And that in itself is wrong. Canada has a racist history, and it's a history that people do not want to learn about. They don't want to know. They would rather turn a blind eye to the fact that this exists. In 1901, the Canadian census classified people in four categories of race, white, red, yellow, and black. If you were mixed, you were what was the lowest race on the ladder. So if you were white and red, you were red. If you were white and yellow, you were yellow. If you were yellow and black, you were black. Okay, this is Canada's history. This is in Canada's narrative. Right? We like to think we're not a racist nation. We're not like the US because we didn't have formal legal segregation. Yes, you did. You had the Indian Act. And those census categories as to who's white, who's red, and even the legal cases over whether or not Inuit are Indians or not under the Indian Act are all examples of that. And I think it's people's unwillingness to acknowledge that or want to admit to that that feeds into it. But right now we're being shamed as saying, oh, you're too sensitive. It's not really racism. Right. It's an honor. Well, no, because it comes from a racist past and a racial narrative that persists to this day in Canada. So that's why we have to challenge it, and I you know, have the greatest respect for you doing it, and I think he needs all of our support to say, you know, settler, you know, indigenous needs our support to say, this is wrong. This racial past, like, it comes from a place. Absolutely. It was a science. It emerged in the mid to late 1800s and, and was built on narratives of who's civilized and who's savage, but there was a science around it, around measuring people's heads to decide who was what race, right? This is part of Canada. Absolutely. And this is a part that we're, we're challenging right now. Um, you know, the, the pride that, that Canadians feel for being Canadian, everybody, at the, and, and American, like, nobody's more proud than Americans and Canadians for, for being Canadian and being being American. But what, what needs to be acknowledged, nobody has to, like, you know, feel bad about it, but what needs to be acknowledged before we can move forward is the fact that it, uh, it's your pride and being Canadian is based on a huge pillar of racism. You can't come to a country and colonize people and, and because you think that your race is better than theirs without extreme racism. So having the, the, the pride of being Canadian stems from a huge pillar of racism that nobody really needs to, nobody seems to uh, realize that. So starting conversations, just to acknowledge it, that, that way we can start moving forward it is, is extremely important. Did, um a few years ago, there was another school in the area that went through a similar process of changing their name. I think it was South Carlton, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It was the Redskins. It was the Redskins. And I remember what was remarkable about that, that situation was that the student body got engaged in the discussion. Has that happened at the uh, end? No, we haven't even heard from them. They haven't even acknowledged that we exist yet. Because they use because that in South Carlton they use it as an opportunity to have this kind of discussion. Right? That would have been amazing. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
they've been, the organization has been provided with um, the evidence of why it's one race is too harmful to children. And uh, as he has indicated, we haven't, we haven't heard uh, back other than the declaration that it was to um, not done in, in for the intention of, of being offensive, but that it was viewed as being um, honoring the strength and courage of Aboriginal people. Um, and I mean, there was some uh, claim that there was uh, Aboriginal support to it. I think this has been discussed in the media. Um, but I think that part of the conversation here today can be cultivating the same type of conversation that happened in South Carlton. There's so much, only so much I can do, only so much Ian can do. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping you know, that the discussions that have happened since uh, the press release was issued about the filing of the complaint is starting that conversation because I mean, it's not about football. And it's not an attack on the league or, or, their, or their coaches or their volunteers or the true legacy of a positive contribution that they have provided. But there's a but, a big, big but. And uh, that conversation needs to happen. Um, they haven't wanted to have that with Ian or me. So the conversation will happen in another way. Um, in, the, in the news that or the radio show I listened to it, where the Mr. Maracle said that the, there was 11 Aboriginal organizations that supported the, the name change. Uh, came to, it came as a big surprise to the Adult Board. Immediately released a press release saying that uh, we hadn't been consulted. I'm not entirely sure at the moment if the previous board had been consulted or not, or what their stance was on. We're looking into that, but the board as it stands now, where we weren't consulted, and even if they were consulted a year ago when this came up again, they should have came to us and said, you know, what is your viewpoint? They didn't do that. <laughs> really pisses me off that they didn't. Um, Adawa has uh, written a letter to the uh, OAC asking them to explain this process to us. Why, why weren't we consulted? Why did they say this? And how is it that you can stand there and say that <laughs> when somebody asks you if Redskin is uh, offensive to you as an Aboriginal person, why isn't the answer universally and emphatically, yes, it's offensive and don't use it? So we're holding them accountable and Adawa, the Friendship Center, uh, we stand with you guys. Uh, and then the entrance. Maybe a quick thing to go on this is uh, the irony of the situation that I shared with you two earlier is this. Um, I've had the amazing opportunity for Rufus Agahan Youth Art Camp this, uh, this summer, which is chaired by Mr. Miracle and the Auto Aboriginal Coalition. So therefore, what happened is I reached out to Mr. Miracle because I heard about his stance, his position, about you know endorsing the term Redskin. And I was like, listen, would you feel comfortable during one of our workshops during the Sagahan New Heart Camp, me using the term to refer to one of the youth? And obviously his response was no. So why are you taking this position? We will quickly move on to the, the final part of the discussion and then like, I'm just trying to get us back to schedule behind. And then we'll get to the audience and then we can all eat some food and be happy together. All right, so, uh, so we've discussed you know, naming places, naming people, naming teams. Uh, and so I'll just read it. The issues around naming, whether to give a name to an area or statue or to rent the use of a racist name from being used is linked to the broader theme of decolonization. Is this that uh, this is a theme that the Negan events have all had? In other, in what other ways do you think decolonization manifests? And I believe we'll start with Kai on this one. If you don't mind me throwing it at you, it's a really easy question. <laughs> it's in our minds. It's in our homes. It's as parents. Uh, I, I don't. It's. It's about. Uh, uh, for me, it's. We can do this like. No, it's to me. It's I want my son to 
I live in a country where being an inner man is something to be really proud of. And I want him to go hunting, and I want him to speak his language, but I also want him to feel comfortable that he could be the prime minister. There's nothing about his skin, his genetics, his history that prevents that. That's what it's about, the, the goal. psychological pattern, the behaviors, the attitude, the arrogance that you have, the sense of entitlement. Um, looking around and looking, it starts with looking at your environment. When you see a tree for paper, you're colonized. You think in a colonized way because this is a, a being with a spirit. You look at the river, the river, if you really listen, we'll talk to you, you know? It's not a river only for water to benefit me as a human being. You've got to leave this anthropocentric uh, vision on the side and start looking in a holistic way, go back to your circular way of relating to each other and understanding the world. And this for me is decolonization. And I'll go even further. We need to re-indigenize ourselves. Reconnect with what's really important. You know? uh, uh, and, you know, I am on this journey, a young, a young lad on this journey, and uh, I look at the mountain and, you know, I'm a student till I, I die, you know, from the, from the first day I was born to the, the day I pass, i always going to be a student. And if we keep that kind of attitude and trying to, you know, take the uh, seven grandfather's teaching, take uh, uh, all of this rich, the rich teachings that, that gravitates around, that uh, gravitates around us, that were forgotten, that were, that were, that were, you know, people were trying to destroy those teachings, trying to hide those teachings, right? They're resurfacing now. We're in an era, right, if you follow, you know, the Anishinaabe uh, Seven Fire Prophecy, Eight Fire, if you want to call it Eight Fire, we're in that era of resurfacing. People, things are, are, are resurging or re resurfacing. So it's up to us to acknowledge, honor, and take that and run with it and try to, um, you know, inspire, empower, uh, share, talk. You know, this is, this is the best way, you know, to do things. And yeah, man, and I'm going on a tangent there. Okay. So, yes, that's, that's, that's kind of my take on this. Um, much. Does anyone else want to share really quickly? Uh, when I say really quickly, it has to be concise. Uh, anyone, another way is just decolonization uh, um, as itself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess the easiest way is just to acknowledge that there's all colors of people sitting in the crowd here and your supporters, and we recognize that. Appreciate the fact that you're standing here with us and that you come out to our events and you stand with us. That's one way of decolonizing. Um, and we want to know that we're very thankful for your support when you do come out and support us. Tell a friend. Yeah. If you want to introduce me, I don't want to silence anyone, but just, just <laughs> keep in mind like, I have this time constraints. Let's go. I'll be brief. Yeah, but again, and it links to what you were saying, um, because, and, and, I'll, and I'll quote a, an Aboriginal uh, woman from uh, Australia, Lila Watson, and it's, and, a, and it's a quote I use often when we do our work with mostly non-Indigenous people. And Lila said, uh, and, you know, and I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember the exact word, but she said, if you've come here to help me, then you're wasting your time. But if you've come because you understand that your struggle is bound up in mine, then let us walk together. And I think that's a key component of decolonization. We have to recognize that all of us are colonized and that we all have to work together to address, them. first of all, to recognize it and then to address it and, and, and find the solutions. Yeah, I just, just, just reminding you of something else that um, the, the colonization isn't necessarily the individual people that are like sitting in the crowd that want to colonize us or 
the ancestor that colonized us, it was the government. It was the, the governments who told their soldiers, come out and do this, do that. It was, it was the governmental bodies that colonized the, 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 this, this continent. This, so, yeah. Decolonized. <laughs> but we're going over there. Yep. But I think, um, especially from the Native Sexual Health Network's um, perspective, it's not just about decolonization, like you had mentioned, it's really about re-indigenization of what we do. So we support youth learning about colonization so that they can be agents of change, and that they shouldn't have to wait until they're apprehended by, by child welfare or the jail or prison before they know what it means about changing systems and things like state violence. And so these are the places where we work with youth, and we you know that's from experience. We know that's that's what hap that's what's happening. Boom, uh, Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, I think everything has has been said already. Um, it just unlearning, and then listening, and then perhaps relearning in that process, um, and just knowing that asking more questions asking more questions about what you think you know about where you come from and knowing that history is not a single narrative. It never has been and it never will be. And the history that shows up in your textbooks that tell you Native people showed up at, in the War of 1812 and then disappeared afterwards is pretty much wrong. Uh, that's the one I had in grade six. Uh, it's pretty wrong. Uh, I also went to well, a high school temporarily that had the, they were the Dennis Morris Redmen. That was our, our mascot, was a red man. Um, and the football team would wear a big feathered headdress and dance around, it was great. Um, but yeah, it's, it's unlearning, right, is, is the key. Unlearning what you think you know and, and being okay with not knowing everything. I don't know everything. And I, you know, some of um, my teachers have said to me, you can never know, like in, increase systems of thought. To say you know something is actually quite wrong because you can never fully come to know something. Um, but you can come to pathways of understanding and I think that's the thing, and being okay with not knowing. It's not actually that scary to say, I don't know. I say it all the time in a space where I'm often told I should know. And when students come to me and think I should have all the answers, I say, you know what, I don't know. I don't know, I can't, it's just impossible. And I think if we apply that reality to it, it can get better. Okay, wonderful. Uh, you got to tell the panelists.